All right, well, thanks for coming back. Um, so today I'm going to uh, tell you a bit of the other side of the story. And let me first remind you what we did before. Uh, we have started with uh, the probabilistic side uh, of this love and energy. So I tell you about the universality of a Brownian motion and why defi defining SLE is the natural, a natural thing. And from the SLE, we obtain the love and energy. And especially when kappa goes to zero as the large deviation rate function for SLE. And the definition of SLE involves the exploration process where I have to keep mapping my curve, uh, open a curve and map it to the upper half plane, defining the driving function, and then, then define the Dirichlet energy uh, to be the Lovner energy of the curve. So it's a very exploration uh, process. And then I showed you that this Lovner energy, which defined, uh, as can actually be defined as a very simple quantity, uh, is equal to the universal Liouville action. And this is just this uh, formula where I have f prime squared dA plus log h prime. So my curve is here, gamma. F is a conformal map uh, from the unit disk to inside of a curve. And h is a map from outside of the disk to outside of a curve. And there is another term, 4 times log of f prime of 0 divided by h prime of infinity. So you haven't, if you haven't followed what the SLE development, you can just take this as a definition of the Lovely energy. And this global action, this is uh, defined first by uh, Tak Tai Zhang. And yesterday, we discussed about uh, how one can get the Lovner energy to this formula. And uh, the intermediate step is to relate to determinants of Laplacian. And because of the determinants of Laplacian, the one we are taking the zeta regularized determinants of Laplacian, uh, this also relates to the Brownian loop measure. So this is the side of on the side of a random conformal geometry. So today I'm going to tell you the side of uh, how is that happens to appear in Teichmann theory. So only this formula, the universal level action, will be relevant. Uh, so when we discuss about this. OK, maybe let me just uh, start with the very basics uh, uh, of the, what I mean by Teichmann spaces. So you, uh, I will be looking at this so-called the universal Teichmann space. It denotes by T1. And it's defined as this homogeneous space of quasi-symmetric homeomorphism when I mod out by Mobius transformations. OK, here, QS of S1, this is the family of circle homeomorphisms uh, with the property that uh, for N, there exists M. Uh, for any theta between 0 and 2 pi, any t belonging to 0 and pi, I have 1 over m less or equal to phi i theta plus t 
minus phi exponential i theta phi exponential i theta minus phi i theta minus t that's so equal to m so what it says is that uh, it's called quasi symmetric it's I have my homeomorphism from the circle to the circle. If I take any three points, uh, which has equidistant, under this phi map, uh, they will be mapped to another three points. Uh, they're not necessarily equidistant, but their distance between them uh, will be bounded. The ratio of the distance between them will be bounded above and below and uniformly. So this is definition of a quasi-symmetric. And the Möbius map, It is just um, all the Möbius transformations which preserve the circle, and uh, can either write like a PSU one one, or concretely just the family of map uh, taking this form alpha z plus beta, beta bar z plus alpha bar, where alpha beta complex number and uh, alpha square minus beta square equals 1. So it's a three-dimensional uh, group. So I'm cautioning, so I'm considering two uh, homeomorphism as being the same element if they just uh, uh, they differ by uh, post-composition by an element here. And or I can just say uh, this is the same as this phi being quasi-symmetric, but phi uh, fixes plus minus 1 and i. Then I don't have to caution out anything. Just one question. Yeah. Why is it called t of 1? Uh, yeah, OK. I will come, come to it uh, very, very quickly. So this is the other, so the one basically they would def refer to a trivial group. There is no group action. So it, it would relate to other Teichmuller space where you have a, a function group uh, there. Okay, let, uh, okay, let me just uh, give you another way to describe this. The good thing of taking quasi-symmetric homeomorphism is that every quasi-symmetric homeomorphism of the circle can be extended to a quasi-conformal map uh, of the disk. I'm using uh, every phi a quasi symmetric can be extended to a quasi conformal homeomorphism of the disk so this is d to d and by quasi conformal uh, this means some uh, regularity assumption, this is called ACL condition, uh, absolute continuous on lines. So this is some technical condition. It basically means that for each rectangle and for almost every vertical lines and almost every horizontal lines, uh, the map itself is absolute continuous along these lines. And this condition will allow us to define uh, the, the next property is more important. So homeomorphism, let me call this homeomorphism uh, uh, W. The d bar of W equals divided by d of W. I define it's called mu. Uh, this is called 
uh, complex dilatation. Dilatation. This satisfies the subnorm of mu is strictly less than one. Okay, uh, this d bar is the complex derivative. So d bar of w is just a, a one half. This is one half dx plus i dy, and d is one half dx minus i dy. So if your map W is conformal, uh, this d bar of uh, a conformal map uh, is always zero. So if you check this, it will be corresponding to the Cauchy Riemann equation of uh, the map. So this ratio is kind of telling you uh, how far this map uh, W is away from being conformal. And the fact that this is pointwisely less or equal to one, less to Less than one is saying that this map is orientation preserving. But being quasi-conformal, it asks you this mu to be uh, uniformly bounded away from one. All right, so the quasi-conformal map uh, is a little bit more flexible. Uh, and for instance, if you have a, a conformal map from the disk to itself, then you know it has to be one of the Möbius map. Uh, that doesn't have so much of a degree of freedom. But for quasi-conformal map, uh, you have a little bit more of a freedom to distort your, uh, your disk. Although there's some more uh, flexibility, but it still has a similar good property than conformal map. For conformal map, we have the Riemann mapping theorem, which says any simply connected domain uh, with more than two boundary points are conformally equivalent, and you have uh, uh, degree three degree of freedom in choosing this conformal map. And for quasi-conformal map, there is a similar result. Uh, this is uh, measurable for the Riemann mapping theorem. And um, we're just going to define so any uh, so uh, let, let me just define it for uh, for the C. So if mu is a map from C hat to C, measurable, very little assumption uh, with subnorm of mu being less than one. Uh, then there exists uh, up to a unique up to post composition uh, by Mobius transformation. This is a r the conformal map of the Riemann sphere. Solution W from uh, the Riemann sphere to the Riemann sphere such that d bar of W over d of W equals mu almost everywhere. Right, if mu is zero everywhere, this would just be the uh, Riemann mapping theorem for the sphere. Uh, there exists a unique, which is a Mobius transformation itself. And uh, we can also replace this. Uh, you can also replace this by any simply connected domain D. And there is this unique uh, 
up to post-composition by conformal map. Automorphism from D prime to D prime. So solution of D to D prime. So simply connected. Yeah, if, if I start to have my mu on the C hat, then the solution uh, has to be on the C hat. Uh, I mean, the target of mu is also C hat. Uh, here is just complex number. Okay. Sorry, it's, com it's a number less than one. Okay. Oh, I see. Yeah. So this is uh, the dilatation is uh, measuring how far it's away from being a circle. And it has also geometric. Uh, interpretation is that you know for conformal maps uh, it will send small circles to uh, small circles, and quasi conformal map they send small circle to uh, ellipses, infinitesimally, but this eccentricity is bounded as a it's a function of this uh, modulus of uh, mu, <coughs> and when mu is one is going to clash uh, to the. Uh, see how this uh, Riemann sphere. You, you put the infinity, add infinity to the, uh, your complex plane. Yeah. There is a relation between the M and the quasi conformal constant. So when you go from quasi symmetric to quasi conformal. Yes. Uh, so here is a good remark that um, if you have a quasi symmetric uh, map, there, there are many, many ways to extend to a quasi conformal map. And there are uh, like for instance, Berlin Offals, they gave you one uh, extension. There are other uh, canonical extension, like draw the Earl, and one can control this quasi conformal constant, meaning the subnorm of mu, uh, in terms of uh, the M. It it's, uh, it's might not be optimal, but uh, at least there's some bound. So here I'm saying each quasi-symmetric homeomorphism can be extended to a quasi-conformal homeomorphism from the disk to the disk. Uh, the converse is also true. Any quasi-conformal homeomorphism from the disk to the disk, they can be extended continuously to the closure, and the boundary value will be also be quasi-symmetric. And let me just give a name to this, also this equation. Uh, this is what we call uh, the Beltrami equation. Uh, so sometimes this mu is also called the Beltrami coefficient. Uh, the question here, the re measurable Riemann mapping theorem is just say, OK, if I prescribe how quasi-conformal my map is, uh, how many solutions there are, and they're exactly one up to this trivial transformations. Okay. So now we are going to write this T1 uh, in another way. Okay, so using this, this will be family of Beltrami coefficients, uh, which would be L infinity 1 D2 so here, uh, this one means that mu is less than 1. And I will have to mod out a uh, equivalence relation. And we say mu and nu are equivalent if uh, they are the complex dilatation of a QC extension of the same phi. All right, for each phi, there, there are tons of ways to extend them. And I can I just now collect their complex dilatation into this uh, family. 
and I just quotient out if they come from the same extension, extension of the same map. And then this, this identity here uh, would just be uh, from phi, okay, from mu, how well, I get go from mu to phi, so I would have, so if I start with mu, I define omega a w mu, Uh, restricted to the circle where w mu from d star to d star. And let me put the, I'm going to put the, uh, this is just convention, I will put this mu to be the outside outer disk. And for each mu on the outer disk, I can find the quasi conformal map from the outer disk to the outer disk, uh, solving the Beltrami equation uh, with d bar you still requiring them to fix plus minus one yeah yeah right so uh, so here when we solve this uh, like so fixing You know the solution. Uh, once I fix away, fix it, fix these three points, then uh, this solution to the Beltrami equation is unique. All right? It's you have this unique solution, and I look at its boundary value. Uh, it gives me the homeomorphism that I come with. I, is it easy to see why fixing these three points doesn't put any restriction on you? Uh, no, because you mean like, so each mu, you have this uh, unique solution. And if I start one from here, I can always extend to a quasi conformal map from the serum uh, there. The yeah. Okay, so this will be the second model of uh, this uh, universal Teichmann space. And now I'm explaining why this is called universal Teichmann space. Let me put here. So a classical Teichmann space, so if I have a, con a Riemann surface, I say of genus complex uh, with complex, uh, compact Riemann surface with genus larger than two. I can do a bit more generally, but let's take this one. I know this can be uh, written as, uh, I'll use the outer disk, quotient out by uh, gamma, where Gamma is a discrete group, subgroup of uh, PSU1, or oh, Möbius S1, this or, all right, you have a, a covering map where you wrap around uh, using gamma, uh, you get this surface down there. And the Teichmann space is the space of all possible uh, quasi-conformal deformation of uh, the surface, which is here, up to a certain isotopy. So if I have a quasi-conformal map from downstairs, I might send to some uh, the distorted Riemann surface. So each of their Riemann surface, there's, there's a well-defined uh, notion of uh, com is a complex surface where, where you know what does it mean to be a perpendicular for curves. And the quasi-conformal maps is going to change these angles uh, from here to here. So this will be another uh, Riemann surface. But here, if I have a quasi-conformal map here, I will be able to lift this so this will be another covering. Some other uh, group. And then this quasi-conformal map can be lifted to a quasi-conformal map here, upstairs. And each of the fundamental domain here, and this will be a one fundamental domain, 
is mapped to some other fundamental domain here. Right, and, and but also because that quasi-conformal map comes from the same uh, surface that you lift it up, then this quasi-conformal map has to behave nicely under the action of uh, gamma. So the Teichmann space T gamma, or oh, you can write Tg, uh, because T gamma, this is the collection of mu L infinity 1 of uh, but under a condition this will be mu composed with A times A prime bar over A prime equals mu for any A inside gamma. Okay, here A is gamma is a acting is a acting on D star, and uh, mu has to transform uh, invariantly under this this rule. Yeah. Uh, covering is um, so it's locally holomorphic, and uh, um, yeah, it's a, it, so d it's the universal cover of. Uh, this Riemann surface. Yeah. So yeah. So the reason why mu has its funny transformation rule is secretly because it's not a function but a, like a quadratic differential or something. It's a uh, called Beltrami uh, differential. So it's a uh, you denote like. Oh yeah. 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 So. This is basically definition of uh, omega minus one. The Beltrami. So wi which where this minus one one come from is uh, coming from uh, this uh, oh, yeah. expression. Yeah, you just expand this if I uh, compose by post compose uh, pre compose by conformal map, you will see that mu will transform like that. And also, uh, it's not exactly correct. Uh, one has to consider uh, quasi conformal maps up to isotopy, and one can be shown that. You can just write this uh, as an equivalence relation on this family of mu covariant uh, under the equivalence diff relation exactly as the same one as the universal Teichmann space. So this is the same as for T1. And this, so one, if you compare this, one would just say, okay, there's no uh, constraint on the action, so the trivial group. So in this way, uh, this is uh, all these Teichmann space, they all embed into uh, the universal Teichmann space. And that's why this is called a universal. All right, what it has to do with our curves, uh, let me just, I'll give you again another. It's uh, just a usual Teichmann space. Yeah. Yeah, the quotient is uh, this one. Yeah, yeah. So now we have two models. Okay, next one. So once we have a mu, I will let w mu. So here the mu is uh, on the top. And it's a different one than the one here. Uh, mu be a homeomorphism from the sphere to sphere, fixing plus minus one and i, uh, solving the Beltrami equation. zero in D and mu in D star. Okay, now this is a quasi conformal map on the whole sphere. And 
And in particular, if I restrict to my, this map uh, on disk, it is conformal. So the third model of this universal Teichmann space, put it here. Uh, can I erase uh, this part, the yellow part? Let me keep uh, the notation. Omega mu is from d star to d star. And uh, phi equals omega mu restricted to the circle. And now I'm going to write this as family of univalent map. So this means it's uh, holomorphic injective. disk to the sphere with f fixing plus minus 1 and i and f admits qc extension to the whole sphere. And what is this map here is uh, I go from mu to omega sub mu restricted to d. Okay, this would be my f map. Right. If I start with the element here, uh, I will be able to find f. And if I start with an f here, because it admits a quasi-conformal extension to the whole sphere, uh, mu would be its complex dilatation outside. What is not obvious is that if two mu they're equivalent, they will give you give rise to the same uh, function f. Uh, this is uh, true. So this will be the next one. And the last one, this will be gamma quasi-circle. Going through plus minus 1 and i. And what this map here is, uh, is just taking f to the image of the circle. So, so I'm a bit confused about this third, third line. Yeah. So you start with the, you say start with the mu, yeah. and then you can always extend, it's so a mu is something on d star, you can extend it to something from the whole. Yeah, extend to zero. Yeah. Uh, f is supposed to be like doubly restricted to. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, f is the solution. So f will be conformal because the ah, okay. complex dilatation is uh, zero. Ah, okay. So in, uh, univalent, means Conf holomorphic uh, injective. Okay. Mm. Injective because like, all the hom quasi conformal solutions, they are homeomorphisms. There's a reason there's different ways, each of them having their advantage, and uh, uh, we're going to use use them. So, uh, what is gamma here? Gamma is a curve. It's a quasi, uh, oh, a yeah, a quasi circle. So this is the image oh, F. Yes, you just look at, okay. yeah. And now we, I'm going to tell you how one can go from gamma back to phi. And this is called the welding.
from gamma to phi. Okay, how we do? So now I have my curve gamma going through one i minus one. So I have there's conformal map f, conformal map h. I will ask this a little bit different than before. Now this f and h conformal. Uh, so this is from d star to omega star uh, d to omega, fixing the three point. OK, so I actually know what these maps are. Let's see. So f, what is f? f uh, was my omega mu restricted to the disk. What is h? OK, h, I, I didn't have a conformal map. Because everything has been uh, quasi-conformal outside, but I can uh, show that this is, I can use the one which is uh, omega mu composed with omega sub mu restricted to d star. OK, what is, I just, let me recall, this is a map from d star to d star. The omega mu is just mapping the outer disk to outer disk by stretching a little in the mu direction, sorry, inverse. And I'm take, I'm have to take the inverse of that. And then I compose with this map omega mu, which is going from uh, the outer disk to outside of the curve. All right, and because they have the same uh, Beltrami uh, differential, this is also a computation, uh, but you can check this uh, d bar over d of this equation. Is 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 Beltrami differential would be zero. So this is actually conformal. So this will be a conformal map, and it fixes always the same three point. So this is the same map as h. So all that now I'm saying from this. I get h inverse composed with f. What you get is exactly omega mu restricted to the circle. If I take h inverse composed with f uh, restricted to the circle, I just get back my homeomorphism phi. Okay, let me just recap what we did. I, I went all the way from phi uh, to gamma, and now from gamma, I want to recover my homeomorphism phi. And what I do is that I take two conformal maps, from one from the unit disk to omega, the other from outside disk to outside of the curve, normalized in a property. And then I look at this map, if I, like h inverse of f, what it does is, I start with a point on the curve. I map f, so it will be sent to a point on, on my curve. And then I use h inverse to come back from outside. So this is a homeomorphism from the circle to circle. And this is called the welding homeomorphism. And the whole wild homeomorphism is exactly the phi where we started with. So what is the of quasi circle? Uh, sorry, the quasi circle is is just the image of a circle under a quasi conformal map. So here where phi is the image of f, but f is also restriction of uh, W mu and quasi circle here just means 
Okay, so here you will get from here to there will be just a conformal welding. this left hand side actually. But if you think in terms of F and H, so mm -hmm. they are just conformal maps, right? Yeah, F and so H. So in a way, you could take any F yeah. conformal get a gamma and uh, look at H, and that would be the same theory? Uh, yeah, so th these four theories, they were all equivalent. You can, I have a way from here to here to here to here and back. You can start from anywhere. Mm -hmm. yeah, but if, I, if I start from F, I come from that, right? yeah. from the inside, from D, yeah. and look at the image gamma, yeah. and then look at H, the, yeah. the map from the outside. Yeah. Then you get phi. You can get phi, and from phi you can get this equivalence class of mu. Phi, okay. Yeah. Okay. Phi will be uh, automatically quasi quasi symmetric. Yeah, they will be automatically quasi symmetric. Uh, so, so th this quasi symmetry is uh, is really the framework where everything works really well. Like it gives this uh, correspondence between quasi conformal maps, whereas this is boundary value. They're always quasi symmetric. So all these equivalence they're not not totally obvious. Uh, Okay, uh, let's just look at this space. Uh, it's first of all, this is uh, infinite dimensional. It's very large space, uh, but there is also a nice actions on the right hand side. This is a group. Okay, this is so I can multiply my phi uh, by on the right uh, by another element. It's a homogeneous space. And uh, this space has also a complex structure. And the complex structure would be a more, more easier to see from these two definitions of uh, universal Teichmann space. So mu itself is a complex valued function. And what do I mean by a complex structure? Uh, you have to have a like even dimensional, I have an infinite dimensional manifold. But if in the case of a finite dimensional case, if you have an even dimensional uh, manifold, what you want is that I, can, I want to find the local charts which map is to c to some power. Right? And the complex structure I mean is that, is that I should tell you how one can multiply by i on the tangent spaces. So in the complex plane, you have to, you know the x direction, you, you turn to y direction. And in higher dimension, you have to decide which, which way you turn. So the bicomplex structure, uh, I mean, a homeomorphism is, uh, is an operator from, from a tangent space from each state. If I look at the origin, so origin in this framework, uh, and this should satisfy a property j squared equals minus identity. And it turns out that. Okay, the natural complex structure on the space of mu is that it's a complex function. So a tangent direction will be I add my mu by some infinitesimal direction, but then the j map will just multiply by that direction by i. But that here we are quotienting out uh, by a lot, and uh, in order to say it gives makes sense to define for you a complex structure on the universal Hutchman space, one need to see some consistency uh, uh, property. But from this picture, it's probably more it's clearer that if you have a univalent function, now you don't have to quotient by out by any other thing. And uh, so you can convince yourself that uh, this way to defining uh, mu, the complex structure on mu, uh, 
there could be a way to make it consistent with the. Uh, but there's a lot of computation involved in behind. Like if I move my mu a little bit and see how this f changes, and see if I move mu by one direction multiplied by i, it will be the same as changing f uh, in the same way. But in this way, just to say that there is a natural uh, complex structure on this universal Teichmann space. And moreover, the map, the right multiplication, so this is a map from phi, I map to phi composed with psi, uh, is, is holomorphic. So T1 has a natural complex structure. Which assigns a J vector on each of the tangent space. Uh, can take any with this property. Okay, so here you have the right multiplication, which is taking a point and multiply by another point to, to another point. This is R psi. And being holomorphic, it just says that uh, the right multiplication commutes with the operator uh, J. So here, if I turn by 90 degree on this, at this point, uh, then I mapped using R C to other point. Here I have a J map. Here I have a J map. Uh, being holomorphic, it just says I can first turn by 90 degree and then map to uh, the new point, or I can come from here, map to the new point, then turn by 90 degree. Uh, these two operation they commute. So the, this natural complex structure on T1, which can be obtained from from the complex structure here, can be shown to be to make this uh, right multiplication holomorphic. So in a way, it's to say like here I have a very big homogeneous space, but however the, the complex structure looks everywhere the same. I just move this point. I, I know how to turn it here. Then I know how I turn on all the other points. Uh, so how do you find J using one of these descriptions? Yeah, J here would be on the mu, is you have a complex uh, value function. The J on the infinitesimal mu, you, you would just multiply by I uh, there. And is, is it clear that it's uh, integrable? Like it's not just obvious? It's not, it's not obvious. No. Uh, you can provide the local charts using this F. Yeah, actually, people prefer uh, usually Schwarzen of f because then you don't have to fix this uh, three point Schwarzen. So th this is called embedding, embedding, using Schwartz. All right. And uh, moreover, this embedding here, uh, this is a holomorphic embedding. Essentially, if you know, it's because the same complex structure coming from mu. So we have seen the complex structure. And we can uh, describe this complex structure uh, in this model. And because of the holomorphicity, uh, let's just look at the, uh, the tangent space at the origin. So here, as a homeomorphism, uh, will be this identity homeomorphism. So, so the, I'm in a model one.
All right, this tangent space is given by a vector field. Uh, I, I put it under the rug a bit of the convergence uh, thing, but let's just put it here. So this is B equals, I will write them in, in terms of the Fourier. And here I have the, the universal Teichmann say I will have to mod out this Mobius transformation. And a way to um, modding out that, that is to say, OK, I'm just taking all the Fourier modes where n is not equal to plus, minus 1, and 0. So this, uh, the Lie algebra of Mobius transformation is given spanned by uh, these three modes. And so this is a vector d theta. And because it has to be, if you want it to be a real vector field, you will have to assume that v minus n is vn bar. All right, and what is j here? So the j, which was, has been coming from mu, and one can show that. So this, I think, is uh, uh, Nag Vyovsky who did it first is showing that, OK, in this picture, j of v is very simple. It's just taking the Hilbert transform. I said i times sine of n times vn in theta d over d theta. So this is, you just multiply by uh, this term. And you can check j squared is minus identity. Uh, or, or if you want, you can also say like this uh, exponential i and say that what n is positive is a holomorphic mode, and n is negative, it's anti-holomorphic, uh, spanning an anti-holomorphic vector field. OK. And are there questions? Uh, this is about the complex structure on this uh, universal Teichmann space. Uh, psi, uh, psi is uh, psi is any element of a quasi-symmetric. Here, uh, I can move my points using the right multiplication. Uh, yeah, psi is any. So this uh, R psi is holomorphic for any psi. All right. Okay. So um, usually the the, the Teichmann, universal Teichmann space. It's a, this is the classical theory. But then people start to ask, okay, can I give a Riemannian geometry on it? Uh, by that, I just mean like you want to take also in the product on the tangent space. I want to take in the product on this space, and in a natural way. So this is already observed by uh, string theorists. Uh, I think earlier, maybe Bovik Rajiv. Or on Kirillov, I think the Uriev. Uh, they don't really care about the convergence issue. Like You can think of uh, the theorem uh, states on really the DFS one. So just assume everything converges, uh, decays fast enough. Uh, they show that there exists a unique up to scaling a homogeneous symplectic form. Uh, 
uh, which is compatible with this J. Uh, what do I mean by that? The symplectic form so this will be a Omega uh, so is a symplectic form. So on each tangent space is a skew symmetric uh, two form, bilinear form. And homogeneous uh, means that it's, it's a right invariant. Basically, then you just need to define on this tangent space at uh, identity. So, and the last thing is its exterior derivative. So there should be a three form uh, is zero. So if you just assume these uh, three condition and uh, you just it's a very uh, it's a computation uh, after all, and you can just check how this each exponential i and theta should should have a how if you plug in this each of the different n and k into the symplectic form what, what kind of condition they should satisfy by checking these three and then uh, you can show that omega of u v has to be in the form of i times b sum of uh, U n n cubed minus n U n v minus n. For some v positive. Okay, sorry. This this condition comes from uh, the last one. This compatibility with this J. Uh, it just says that the compatibility this means if I define this inner product you. JV uh, has to be positive definite. The positive definite will tell you this B has to be a positive number. So this is a the unique one. There's only one of them. Uh, you only have the de degree of freedom of choosing this b and uh, and but you you might wonder like, like for instance this uh, this sum might not be converging right because if I have a defect one then this all the Fourier coefficient they decays very fast. This is always de converging, uh, but in general it's not. So in fact, this is converging if uh, u v is in the Sobolev's class of uh, three half, which is defined to be like the uh, n cube uh, convergence. All right. So let me just summarize. What well, we have, we have a complex right invariant complex structure. I have a right invariant symplectic form with, which is compatible with this complex structure, and these together they form a Kähler, just the name called it is Kähler manifold. 
And uh, this, what Tak Da Zhang entailed, what they did is to uh, make this, to expand this result for DFS1 and really care, taking care of a weak convergence class. And they were able to show, well, also by giving rigorously the local charts and the uh, So what they say, let me just draw a picture. This is supposed to be my infinite dimensional uh, universal Teichmann space. And on each point, is tangent space, uh, it, there is a sub-tangent space for which you can define this symplectic form. It will be converging. And this is, let me just draw it here like this. This is the H3 half vector field. It's not the whole tangent space. And also this same vector field, uh, it's, it's right invariant. So at each point I have such a, such a space. And there is the origin. The origin is the identity map. Right, let me just. So for a homeomorphism, is circle homo is the identity map. For mu, this is zero mu. The second, for f, is the identity map. For gamma, it will be just a circle. The circle passing through three points. This is the origin, the best curve. And there is one connected one leaf in the inside this uh, T1. That's uh, the integral manifold, which is tangent to each of those uh, space. And this integral line, integral is uh, still infinite dimensional. Uh, this is what they call T naught one. And not, uh, I think it denotes the connected component which contains the origin. And this is the space uh, we call the Bay Peterson Teichmann space. Yes. This is the aligning the Miller space. It's not a line, it's an infinite dimensional submanifold. Yeah. It's a, yeah, it's a subspace of, uh, it's, a, it's a manifold of uh, universal Teichmann space. So what is the property of uh, phi if yeah. it belongs to T? Yeah, I will give you a uh, characterization in each of this uh, setup. It has been completely known. Let me just write here, maybe. I can write here. So in terms of phi, for phi, this uh, is set log of phi prime belonging to h1 half. Uh, or if you want, it's a harmonic extension of this log of phi prime is Dirichlet. You have finite Dirichlet energy. Uh, for mu, is that mu squared rho is finite. Uh, rho is the hyperbolic density, so this is 1 minus uh, the hyperbolic density on the outer disk, inner disk with outer disk is the same expression. And here I say mu is uh, L2 integrable with respect to the hyperbolic metric. Is equivalent to this fate Peterson. On the next one, for F, this is the one being finite. And this is the one we use to define the fate Peterson quasi circle. So for the curve, is gamma is Bay Peterson. And which is now equivalent to the Lovner energy of gamma is finite. Yes, yes, yes. 
Ouais. 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 On the subspace, you can't take this with some other direction, so it's only always defined on the subtangent bundle. Okay, okay. Yeah. So not, on, not only for identity component, but you have like a foliation of the state. Yeah, right. The, the foliation, because of the right invariance of the whole structure, it will be just the right multiplication of the this leaf to the other. Okay. Let me. Uh, tell you the last thing about it. Well, we have a property for G, the outside one. The yeah, you can also characterize with uh, it's the same. Uh, yeah. And the last thing is that. <laughs> Sorry, this 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 uh, in the national space. Yeah. After the right action of uh, of the Kepler group structure, does it cover the whole space? Or yeah, right. This is a uh, T not one as uh, I mean, I, I, I do whether the trend, uh, the well, T T not one is a group as well. It's a uh, you can okay T not one can be can be written as V Peterson. Where this is collection of phi for which log of phi prime is in h one half, and this is also a group. So you can really get to all the points. It's a super symmetric. It's, it's a very uh, very nice uh, space, and uh, and also maybe I should mention um, also by Takda John Tail for this space, but I think it's come from earlier. Also, Bovik, Rajiv, Kirillov, Yuryev. So they do for the smooth case and tap touch on tail. Uh, they were showing that T not one is uh, Kayla Einstein. In the sense that the Ricci curvature. Uh, you can compute it. Even dimensional, it, it, it's not obvious that Ricci curvature is well defined. Uh, this is the part what they show. Uh, the Ricci curvature is minus 13 over 12 pi of this, the Riemannian metric. And it seems to be a, a mysterious. This 13 appears everywhere in string series. In the, Okay, it's, it's a really very nice uh, space. And the last, the relation to the Lovner energy is actually even more striking. Basically, this is the why tuck tuck on tail study this universal Liouville action. So they show that the Lovner energy or the universal Liouville action. Is a Kähler potential of the Vepeter symmetric. This is uh, called Vepeter symmetric. Huh? Okay, what it means. So, okay, to describe this, I, I need to again pass to the second model. So, this is NAC 
Fayovsky, uh, which says that I have a vector field, so a tangent vector from the first model. I, I should be able to translate that to something uh, infinitesimal Beltrami on the second model. So there's a way to choose a special section. So here, the second model, you have to caution out a lot of things. So uh, probably many mu will give you the same deformation uh, in, in the same direction. But if one choose a very special section, uh, it's called a harmonic Beltrami, which just means it's it's uh, supernorm is finite and uh, that the C equals the form rho inverse C times phi bar Z, where phi is a holomorphic function. I, this is a, it has a name called the Alpha's wide section. So each of the uh, right here, I'm just giving another name. Instead of looking at the vector field, I can look at the, the, this harmonic Beltrami or alpha by the Beltrami uh, differential. And so each of you will give you an element mu u. And what Nagvayovsky they show you is that u v, which is defined there, the V Peterson one, uh, can be written in terms of this mu dot in a very simple way, integrating on the d star uh, multiplied by rho z. Uh, in fact, this, this inner product is uh, first uh, discovered by uh, Bovik Rajiv when they just look at what are the possible Kähler metric on this DFS1. And uh, it's really from Nagfiovsky's work, they show that this one is equal to the right-hand side. And uh, this gives the name of Vey Peterson because the Vey Peterson metric on the classical Teichmann space is just you taking the integral on a fundamental domain. So that is uh, so. This is the Vey Peterson metric on compact sur on the Teichmann space of compact surfaces, and then here in the universal Teichmann space, you're integrating something which is on the whole disk. That's why it's called Vey Peterson. And here, this what is this Vey Peterson Kähler potential? It just means. This Lovener energy or universal Liouville action, it's a functional So this Liouville action, now this is a functional from T not one to R plus. Right, for each T not one, I can associate to a quasi circle. If I have the Peterson quality circle, I can look at its real action, which is still written there. It's uh, functional uh, on this space. Uh, and if you take D D bar, If I take, uh, say, this point, mu and nu, there will be uh, um, each of those uh, harmonic Beltrami, mu dot. Maybe let's take this one. So each of the mu nu bar, they will give you a direction. Okay, each of mu nu bar give you a direction uh, in for which you are taking derivative. Okay, what I didn't say is that this mu nu bar is not only defined on the 
uh, identity, but also from the right translation, you can take this menu to other points as well. And this is equal to also what I have hidden a bit this is partial it's not really the real partial derivative it's the complex one so so each of them this is corresponds to the partial derivative I yeah you, you have a uh, a metric, uh, you have a complex structure, it's yeah. guaranteed. Is it guaranteed you will have a k potential? Uh, if you are Kahler, the Kahler potential is defined in uh, some uh, neighborhood, small neighborhood, but in this case, they can show that it's uh, defined everywhere. Mm. And also, I think it's a. Uh, I shouldn't say. <laughs> yeah, they really they define the function and they check this e equality. Uh, here you just get the V Peter symmetric. What, okay, in the end, what you say is that I have a, some scalar function, and I can recover my unique homogeneous scalar metric by taking two derivative. So let me summarize here. So what we have on the Teichmann series side, we have this T naught one is some homogeneous space. I have group structure, it's a homogeneous space. I have complex symplectic and Riemannian structure. I have Kahler Kahler potential. And even the Kahler Einstein manifold. Uh, it seems to be a, a very rich uh, geometric object. And uh, uh, so there are like 21, or no, I, I think the list probably go up to 30 already, of uh, other equivalent description about this object that I talked a little bit about in the maybe in the second lecture. Um, I think very little are still understood why such a miracle happens that the Kähler potential here is exactly uh, the large deviation rate function coming from SLE. Because they, they, both of them are crucial. Here, this Kähler potential is really at the center of this geometry. This care telling you everything about your metric. Uh, on the other hand, here, this Lovner energy comes from the large deviation of the stochastic processes, uh, arises from very simple axioms. So, so they're crucial for a very different reason, but however, they, they turn out to be the same. I think I will probably skip the break because I'm uh, running. If you're going to go to the restroom, uh, you can just uh, you can catch up with YouTube anyway. Let me ask you a question. Yeah. Yes, uh, a detail. What was the original definition of uh, gamma being vague? Yeah, the, uh, but the first one, maybe uh, this one is the best. This one, this is finite. The definition was what? The F second? F second derivative over F prime is L2 integrable. Yeah. So, the remaining half an half hour, I will just tell you uh, what can we go from here. So, of course, uh, if you see some uh, non-trivial connection between two things, the first question you will ask: Can we uh, connect a bit more? This make this link stronger? 
Here, the only contact point is this large deviation rate function equals to Kähler potential. And how about uh, what is the group structure? Why this is a homogeneous space? And wh what do you see from, from the SLE side? We don't know. What is a complex structure? What is symplectic structure? What is Riemannian structure on the SLE side? Uh, it's not known. And why this determinant of La Passion is relevant? Why, where is the loop measure? Where is the diff wh where this exploration process on the, on the right hand side is also not clear. And one way to explore this uh, link is to try to translate each of the objects uh, to the other side, vice versa. And which is uh, actually uh, not very little thing have been done so far. OK, if we, if we don't do this, we can also try to uh, translate some results from one side to the other. Uh, so for the first one, this is uh, from the random conformal geometry. Can we say something uh, from random conformity to uh, this way Peterson Tajma space? Okay, so, um, well, how this level of energy arises if coming from kappa goes to zero, and we can see w whenever there is a theorem which works for any kappa, especially when kappa goes to zero, there is a hope one can get something from the other side. And what I've shown you uh, last time, uh, maybe two, t two times ago, I don't remember, but th there is this SLE GFF coupling. There are two couplings. One is called the quantum zipper coupling. And the other is the flow line coupling. I think uh, Scott Sheffield call it, and Jason Miller call it imaginary geometry. And we have a version of for the Peterson quality circle. There is also, uh, I think it's a really a culminate, a more complete theory culminating from these couplings is uh, the mating of trees. Theorems. I think uh, um, Duplante, Milo, Sheffield. We all we have a, a version for the Peterson for each of them. Well, let me just give you uh, the, the statement and uh, the ideas in behind. Okay, for the quantum zipper coupling, I already talked a little bit about. Uh, the, very roughly speaking, I have phi is a GFF in the complex plane. I can define this exponential square root of kappa of phi. Uh, this is called the uh, Liouville quantum gravity. the complex plane. And phi has the action square root. Sure. This coupling works for any kappa, not, not just the uh, Well, this is the statement is very, very vague. The, the, the coupling works for kappa less than, strictly less than two, uh, uh, sorry, less than four. Uh, yeah, but also the the, the, st the version I, I stated is isn't uh, completely correct, but it's in some sense correct when kappa goes to zero. And I ignored a lot of things and 
uh, like no terms which vanishes uh, faster, uh, the higher order thing in the uh, statement. Sorry, so, so you mean you put that in the action? Or what is it there? Oh, uh, here, uh, let's just say the large deviation rate function. Yeah, the density, yeah, will be a minus S of phi. So S of phi is this. Okay. Yeah, so the d phi, this is supposed to be the probability measure for the Gaussian fee field. Yeah, so what do you mean by e to the square root of kappa phi? You should just move. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. This one uh, is, the, is the measure. It defines the measure for so phi is a Gaussian field wi which oscillates. Mm -hmm. And I'm taking exponential square root of kappa times phi. It's a uh, very rough. Yeah, dz squared. Uh, is it different from putting that term in the action? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's a different. This is a random field. And this is, uh, this is just a probability density function. Uh, it tells you how how the phi is distributed mm -hmm. uh, in probability space, how, how phi looks like. And here, if I give you any phi, I, I will be able to define this object here. Okay. It, it's, a, it's a random function. I say uh, it equals uh, 1 somewhere, minus 1 elsewhere. And what you get is a measure which is equal to exponential square root kappa somewhere, exponential minus square root kappa somewhere, uh, other places. You, you should think this phi as a, a Gaussian field on the on the complex plane. Uh, so, uh, I mean, just I, th I thought that in Lieber quantum gravity, yeah, but you have it's, it's true. But here she do, she's not doing that. She's not, okay. she's not doing the full UV. Ah, yeah. okay. so you still have just a Gaussian. It's a real measure. Yeah. yeah, yeah. All right. So. Uh, if you, you cut with an SLE kappa, the same kappa, right before I'm saying you have F and H, I will get two random half plane, uh, two half plane with random measure on top of it. Uh, there will be independent uh, exponential of Gaussian field field. So if I want to do a large deviation version of this, so the theorem. So if phi has finite Dirichlet energy, meaning let me, let me just I will define it uh, a 1 over pi and I will just look at this function This measure exponential of two phi dz. So phi is a element is supposed to be uh, the in the large in the common mounting space of uh, this GFF, and I'm defining this exponential for this very special function. Uh, it's more regular than GFF, and uh, defining exponential of two phi times this measure. And in this case, if phi is a Dirichlet, has finite Dirichlet energy, this quantity is well defined as a L1 function. So uh, there is some uh, story behind this Dirichlet function. Then you have to have a vanishing mean oscillation. Uh, such things will allow you to define an honest exponential of this object. Whereas in the for the Liouville quantum gravity, if if you my phi is a Gaussian fee field. These Gaussian field, they have uh, taking value actually plus minus one, uh, minus infinity, 
like all the time. Like it's uh, their their variance is infinity at e every point. And uh, so th these are very very rough things. So in order to define the Liouville quantum gravity, usually one needs to do a lot of uh, truncation regularization. But here, if we start with phi which has finite Dirichlet energy, uh, this quantity is honestly well defined. And if I replace my curve by a finite energy curve, so now this would be a Ve Peterson curve, gamma. And the measure I pulled back will be exponential 2 phi plus log of f prime. Here, 2 uh, composed with f, phi composed with h, plus log of h prime. So, uh, theorem, uh, we, everything is uh, well defined and uh, we would have the Dirichlet energy of phi, so the Dirichlet energy in the complex plane, plus the Levener energy of gamma, if I call this whole thing u, this whole thing v, I get this is equal to the Dirichlet energy of u plus Dirichlet energy of phi. So this is uh, uh, due to, so all this, uh, this analogy I'm going to describe, this on the Vey-Peterson side, this is joint works with uh, uh, Wicklund and myself. Here I claimed, so this is, everything is deterministic. Okay. I start with a finite Dirichlet energy function. I give you some transformation rule like this. Then the sum of the Dirichlet energy of phi and the Lovner energy of gamma is equal to sum of the Dirichlet energy of these two. Why this is analogy of the quantum zipper coupling? So this would be in the exponential of the density function of your Gaussian phi field. If I add up their action or large deviation rate function, this will be taking the product of the density function. And on the left-hand side, ex expressing that I started with an independent Gaussian phi field with an independent SLE, uh, I would get two independent uh, level quantum gravity on the right-hand side. And for the flow line coupling, In the SLEGFF uh, heuristics, is that instead of taking exponential of uh, the Gaussian field field, I'm taking exponential i times square root of kappa uh, Gaussian field field. So if if phi is a smooth function, then you will get some smooth uh, unit vector on the on the complex plane. Or this is a unit uh, complex number. And uh, if I have a smooth phi, then I can define the flow line. <coughs> so as the as the flow line of the vector field. So each point, you will have the field was tangent to the curve. And the SLE GFF coupling, the flow line coupling, is saying that there is a way to make sense of this coupling where I take phi to be a GFF. And this flow line uh, would be SLE kappa. And in the finite energy world, uh, what we show is that 
of course, he, here this is a uh, is total. It's very very hard to make sense of uh, this literal sense. Like already to define this real power, exp real exponential of a Gaussian field, field, one needs to work a lot using circuit average. Uh, but for this imaginary one, it's even worse. Okay. But uh, if we take the case, it's a nicer case. So f phi Dirichlet energy phi is then we can define an honest vector field like this. Such that and uh, any flow line of I phi again in the sense that it, any tangent vector almost everywhere will coincide with this one uh, is the Peterson and uh, we have the Dirichlet energy of phi equals uh, the Lovner energy of the flow line gamma plus the Dirichlet energy of phi minus uh, the harmonic extension. So each of gamma will be just a harmonic extension of phi restricted to gamma. Uh, harmonic extension, so it is harmonic. If I take the harmonic part of uh, my phi, it's uh, so in a sense, So why is uh, the flow the, the analogy of the flow line coupling of SLEGFF? SLEGFF coupling, you will say, also uh, you can decompose your Gaussian field into one part where one part is SLE, which is measurable with respect to your Gaussian field field, and the remainder of the Gaussian field field, if I take out the winding function, the harmonic extension of uh, the value on on the curve. Uh, the remainder has to be a zero Dirichlet uh, Gaussian field field. But, but of course, uh, gamma is not an SLE. Yeah. yeah, yeah, here it's not. Here we are in the case where it's a Vay Peterson. It's not an SLE. So, just one yeah. question. Um, so, um, two questions. Yeah. Um, what are for proving this, which version you take of your gamma? Or you, which version of your equivalent? Uh, yes, probably. it's a good question. Here, for that one, we are using this Lovner energy, uh, not not this one, but for the infinite curve version. And for this one, uh, we are using very simple thing: is that uh, it, uh, you are even laugh at it. So the, for the first one, I'm using this one, uh, gamma equals uh, gradient of log of f prime. This term, and for the other one. What I'm just saying, okay, this is a harmonic function. Its Dirichlet energy will be the same as its uh, harmonic conjugate. This will be gradient of argument of f prime. And what is argument of f prime? Well, argument f of f prime here is is exactly how much uh, the curve turned. I think it's just to show you that, um, well, it's an extremely beautiful story of uh, SLEGFF couplings. Uh, here we are trying to understand it in a more regular setup, and where actually the proof will be very, very simple. And uh, it's just each of the theorem would be, the proof is not longer than a page. And, and also we see the relation between the two couplings, and they're related. Uh, in the SLE GFF coupling with the quantum zipper coupling, you have SLE and GFF, they are independent. In the flow line coupling, the curve is determined by the GFF. 
So it's a, it's a determinist function of the GFF. And here we see this uh, phenomenon also happens for uh, the energy, but one can actually go from one to the other uh, by just doing this very simple trick of here I'm taking the real part of log of f prime and the other side is taking the imaginary part of log of f prime. And for the third part, I th think uh, uh, I would have a much, well, I can say a little bit about the medium trees uh, version of that. that. Yeah. You, you put the exponential too high, right? Yeah. Did you look, what happens if you put another number than, than a different number than two? Um, no, not really, because this two is actually the, the uh, dimension of the, in the Euclidean plane. So do we have, it, yeah. You, you have it to the right, right, with the log of f prime. Yeah, yeah. So I think it's also really because that when kappa goes to zero, the Liouville quantum gravity is dimension is convert. Uh, sorry, gamma to gamma two zero. So kappa to zero is converging to two, right? The dimension it's converging to this uh, Euclidean plane. Yeah. So so that I think that's two is really coming from there. Mm -hmm. But yeah. Maybe you can do some large deviation yeah, uh, for, for different. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, okay. So it shows wh what you did just shows that somehow this uh, E of gamma, this uh, lunar energy, yeah. it's part of the the proper way to weight the GFF, right? When you have boundaries somehow. Mm. I mean, the, the, the standard action of the GFF is just well accepted, but somehow there is a part due to the curve here. Um, the, the boundary function of the GFF should be the harmonic extension of uh, what's the boundary. Some, I think the love energy is really, you, you take into account the both sides of uh, right. the curve. But, uh, your, but uh, your identity is somehow it's from Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah, this is a, it's kind of saying, um, you're mixing, I'm mixing the two energy together in order to... It tells you what to do when you erase the curve somehow. Yeah, we can also go actually go backwards as well. I can start with arbitrary U and V, who are Dirichlet, and we can define this welding map and according to the length, and we would be able, like for any UV you choose, you can be a recover another gamma and phi, and yeah. Yeah, we can discuss uh, no more. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah, okay, yes. Okay, in the mating of trees, at least the way how I understand it, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, also very impressionistic uh, uh, story is that if one starts with a very large kappa, basically kappa, Um, uh, there's a version of a space filling SLE kappa going from infinity to infinity, coming from infinity and also going back to the infinity. So it's going to fill, fill the plane um, in this space filling way. And the medium of tree theorem is saying that if I stop at, uh, at each point, at during your pr process, you can look at its left uh, side and the right side. And whenever you keep growing a little bit more, so like now I, I have grown a little bit more, this boundary would look like this, and this part will look like, like this. So if I feel like all the points using these branches, and the medium of trees is saying that there exists 
a way to define two space failing trees and they just uh, merge together and they fill out the whole plane. And where you can also trace it between the trees and this is giving you um, a space failing SLE. But underlying the of this, there is a, a nice property of SLE duality which relates SLE kappa with SLE 16 over kappa. So if I my kappa is really large, each of these branch, uh, they look like uh, SLE 16 over kappa curve. So for large kappa, they will correspond to very small uh, number here. So in the medium trees, there are, there, there are several objects. There are trees. Um, there are the space filling SLE. The branches are SLE 16 over kappa. And there's also a lingering uh, Liouville quantum gravity uh, behind is that this actually this white curve would also give you a parameterization of a measure on the space of uh, on your whole sphere and this space filling so they will be having two gaussian free field so this the first one is this space filling uh, sle you give a Liouville quantum gravity measure and these branches of SLE, they, they are flow lines. They are flow lines of another GFF. And these two, e each of them, they has one GFF here, and also there's another GFF in, in it. So of course, uh, this. Uh, I think my understanding is really uh, limited, so we, we just try to find a version in the finite energy world, what, what can we say about it? So each of the, these terms has to be uh, having a finite energy correspondence. So first of all, we don't have trees, in fact, but we will keep this uh, space filling SLE. And one should think that when SLE kappa, kappa is really large, this uh, simple curve, they will degenerate. So th th this is not simple. This uh, continuous curve will degenerate and becomes a growing family of uh, compact set which grows from everywhere. So the final version that is already will be very different from the medium of trees theorem. And I can't define everything for you, but I uh, just so this is a uh, what we call the foliation uh, by a Peterson quasi circle. So with Wickland. So we would have to uh, use a, a different version of a space fitting SLE that would be a, a whole plane SLE. So this is a would be a it's a inside the sphere and going from infinity to zero. Whereas in the previous word, it's going from infinity to infinity. But this one, we are looking at the one from infinity to zero. And uh, roughly speaking, so you have a space filling curve which comes from infinity, so everything else is filled. And it keeps growing towards zero. So in the limit, about kappa goes to infinity, the picture that you will see is that this evolution, they're just looking like concentric disk growth. 
Um, yeah, here the setup is a bit different. The SLE would, they will target at the point, and the, but if kappa goes to infinity, is they will have a rotation symmetry. We will see this uh, growth so would be. Uh, well, it's the radial so one. I'm feeling, yeah. Yeah. So this will be the limit. And uh, we also studied one of the, uh, it's a large deviation principle. And this picture should be the one which has the minimal energy. The limit always has a minimal energy. And we define a um, measure. It's a an energy for the Lovner Kufarev energy. And now each energy is, a, is associated to such a foliation. I have to see at time t, time t plus 1, time t plus 3, time t plus 3. The whole process has one energy. Like this. And the Lovner Kufarev energy is, uh, is giving an energy to this picture. And uh, roughly speaking, this large deviation principle is just say, OK, probability of SLE kappa uh, is close to this family of uh, evolution. So dt is uh, the inside of the So here, for each of process, it, it's shrinking. This dt is a shrinking family in the complement of SLE. OK, this when kappa goes to infinity uh, is something like exponential minus kappa times an energy that we define. I didn't have ex time to say, but it's also coming from the large deviation of a brown motion, but when kappa goes to infinity, square root of kappa goes to infinity. And more precisely, we are looking at a large deviation of a local time of brown motion. It's very different from the shoulder serum uh, but, but there's an energy we can associate to a foliation so that the SLE will decay like this. And we can show that if S of this foliation is finite, then any T the boundary of dt is by Peterson. But this is a purely deterministic statement. I define some uh, energy which uh, there is explicit formula one can I can write down. Uh, but this energy is finite. It implies that all the leaves here inside they have to be by Peterson. And this is consistent with this SLE duality. If I know my large kappa large deviation behavior looks like, then its boundary, this will be the outer boundary at each time, should have something to do with the small kappa large deviation. So this is a love energy it involves. And we have also identity between uh, this love and kufa ref energy with the love energy of each leaf. But this thing. Uh, even so, th this is fitting some. It's called Lovner Kufarev because uh, it's actually a way to describe evolution using the Lovner Kufarev equation. And one needs to plug in a measure, driving measure instead of driving function, to generate this foliation. And analytically, it's a, a very tough question to say what kind of uh, domain you get if uh, my measure satisfies such and such property. And here it's really inspired by the SLE duality. We can show that if this energy is finite, then all the leaves, I know exactly how they look like. And so this would be the part which would tell you what would be the replacing this space filling SLE kappa. Uh, this would be just the foliation. So this part would degenerate to foliation. And this branches, there will be a Vay Peterson quasi circle. And the trees, we don't see anymore the trees. Uh, 
because they grow too fast uh, everywhere. And we also have a version, uh, we, we have this uh, Liouville quantum gravity measure and uh, the flow line GFF is also lingering in this picture. Uh, actually, we don't have this one, we just have this one. Uh, this one would come from, if I have a foliation, I will be able to define a winding function which is measuring the angle, uh, how much this curve is different from this uh, concentric circle picture. So there's an angle between and this part of the GFF will correspond to the winding function. And then you have something similar to the here? Yeah, we have that. The lovner kufarev energy is exactly equal to the Dirichlet energy of the winding function. And there are one is finite if and only if the other is finite. And it's, uh, yeah. So th this is the, sorry, it's, uh, sorry for the, the end is a little bit vague, but I think that my key message is that in this finite energy world, things uh, uh, everything is analytically simpler to deal with. Like for instance, this curve, a Peterson quasi circle, they're a rectifiable curve. They're asymptotically uh, smooth, if you still remember what that means. But it's basically a curve which is pretty uh, regular. You can measure the length of it. Uh, whereas for SLE, everything is a, fract it's a fractal curve. It's a bit hard to deal with. It's a random object. And for the Liouville quantum gravity as well, you're taking exponential of uh, some distribution is uh, it's hard to deal with, but if we look at this finite Dirichlet energy field, then everything will be well defined, but we can still recover the similar structure as you see from the random conformal geometry. So I think I, there's a lot of effort going into how we can get results from random conformal geometry back to uh, Bay Peterson uh, Teichmann space. It's the main reason is just I, I'm more familiar with the random conformal geometry side. And we should hope that if we know things about Bay Peterson, we should give us back to also new results for random conformal geometry. And there are a few examples. Uh, for instance, we can think about what are the uh, nice objects for this Bay Peterson Teichmann space. Uh, for instance, we know this Liouville, Liou universal Liouville action is a Kähler potential. And what do we know about Kähler potential in general? And you can s start to uh, try to cook up the similar thing for SLE. I'll give you one example. So this is a work in progress. Uh, with Bridgman, uh, Ken Bromberg, Vargas Palette, and myself. So we, we study the renormalized volume. Essentially, in some other setup in the Teichmann theory where there's other Liouville action for which the renormalized volume is uh, relevant, uh, we just use the idea from what is known for Teichmann space for compact surfaces and to try to bring it to the universal Teichmann space to define this following thing that the, the renormalized volume, so that is. I, I take my curve gamma in my complex plane and I put it into the hyperbolic three space. So now the complex plane is the boundary of my hyperbolic three space. And we can show that at least now is if gamma is smooth, then the Lovner energy of gamma is exactly equal to some four times uh, renormalized volume of gamma. What that is, is that we will be able to define 
two surfaces. It's, uh, they are called Epstein surface. So each, um, each Epstein surface is associated to a um, conformal metric inside and outside. So e this surface is associated to inside. This surface is associated to the, uh, the outside. And the renormalized volume is the volume in between these two surfaces. minus, if I call this set n gamma, minus integral of the one half of the mean curvature on each of these two surfaces. All right, so, so this is what we call the holography, holographic principle of the Lovner energy, which is just saying, if I know something on the boundary, the conformal boundary, can I say something about what is uh, inside the bulk? And uh, it, it's an extremely natural setup uh, to consider the hyperbolic three space uh, with respect to the boundary, because you know this Lovner energy or Ray Peterson quasi circle, they are Möbius invariant. This if you apply conformal maps, so if, uh, it's the uh, same class, the energy is preserved. And PSL2C, this Möbius transformation, is exactly the isometry group of the hyperbolic three space. So it's very natural to ask if I have a conformally invariant object on the conformal boundary, can I say something about uh, isometry invariant quantity in the, in the bulk? And this is uh, what we get. So we, we compare this result to uh, what Chris Bishop did. I think this result was really inspired by uh, his uh, work. He was saying, okay, that gamma is very Peterson if and only if uh, you can find a minimal surface. It will be a surface, just one surface uh, for, which the, for which the total curvature is finite. He has also a version of this by saying, if I look at the convex hull of gamma, the convex hull would be something a bit thicker. So the convex hull, you just join, for each two points that you draw a cir half circle connecting the curve. This convex hull, uh, he has also a characterization in terms of his convex hull, but this convex hull uh, condition is that gamma is very Peterson, if and only if the integral of the thickness squared is finite. Thickness is uh, the closest the point distance to the other side. You take a thickness squared, integrate against the surface, uh, it's finite. This is what Chris Bishop did. Um, and our work is to find the exact formula for the Lovner energy. So I, I really don't know what implication it would have for SLE or random conformal geometry, uh, but I think this is the first step for the holographic principle. Okay, uh, sorry for running over time again and uh, with uh, no break either. Uh, thank you.